Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, July 12th, 2020, and we are live. Hope everyone is doing well today. There's a lot going on. This has been a very, very busy week. We see coronavirus is raging. We saw that on Friday, uh, the U.S. set a record of uh, 69,000, about 69,000 new cases. We see states like Florida are setting records pretty much every day. Um, so there's a lot going on. On uh, tonight's show, we're going to be joined shortly by economist and author Dr. Julian Malvo. Dr. Julian Malvo, you see her on MSNBC, CNN, you see her on Roland Martin Unfiltered. And I've interviewed her before, um, right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation as well. Uh, so we're going to be joined by Dr. Julian Malvo, who is featured in the upcoming documentary uh, called Hapi. Uh, Hapi, the role of economics on the development of civilization, the role of economics on the development of civilization. And you know, I interviewed um, about, about three weeks ago um, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, one of my teachers, and Professor Jane Small. Another one of my teachers as well. They're featured in this documentary from director Taiki Grant. Taiki Grant. So we're going to talk uh, with Dr. Julian Malvo uh, about the film, and then also we'll talk to her some about the uh, state of economics for African Americans as well. Okay. So you don't want to uh, miss that conversation. Now, this past week, we know that um, Blackout Day took place, and Blackout Day was designed this past Tuesday. Blackout Day was designed to uh, have African Americans not spend uh, money outside of their community, only spend money with African American-owned businesses, uh, etc., to send a clear message about the power of the African American dollar. And uh, News1.com had an article about this, and also the Grio as well. And uh, the Grio had, had a follow-up article dealing with how um, African-American-owned businesses uh, saw an increase in the support of their businesses uh, on uh, Blackout Day, okay, Blackout Tuesday. So we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit. Uh, then also U.S. sets a uh, coronavirus update. U.S. sets record for new COVID cases at $69,000 69, in one day. And then also we saw that um, Florida uh, had 15,000 um, 15, new cases uh, in a single day uh, also. That was on uh, Saturday, if uh, I remember correctly here. It was on Saturday, 15,300 new cases for the state of Florida. And... All this ties into the mishandling of the coronavirus tied to the economy by one incompetent person, Donald John Trump. And, and, and speaking of Donald John Trump, this past Friday, Trump gave a commutation to convicted felon Roger Stone, who is a sycophant and crony and former campaign advisor Donald Trump. Trump commutes Roger Stone's prison sentence after he was convicted of covering up for the president. And this ties into the Russian investigation, the Russian investigation that Donald Trump calls a hoax and a witch hunt, but Robert Mueller found a lot of witches in the witch hunt, if it was a witch hunt. No, it wasn't a witch hunt, they're just following the evidence. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that because um, uh, Attorney Kristen Clark posted on her Twitter page about this and she talked about how Khalif Browder was a minor and Khalif Browder did three years in Rikers Island for a crime apparently he did not commit but he was at Rikers uh, awaiting trial because his family did not have it was approximately a thousand dollars they had to put up for bail. He came from an impoverished background. And here you have a convicted felon who gets 
a commutation from the president. But a lot of people are saying, well, uh, Donald Trump, uh, 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 Roger Stone has a lot of information on Donald Trump and WikiLeaks. And Trump doesn't want Roger Stone spilling the beans on what he knows. So you're going to hear more about that. We'll talk some about that. We're still waiting on uh, Donald Trump and the Trump administration to come out with a coherent strategy to address Russia putting bounties, putting a bounty on uh, American soldiers. You, you notice how they're trying to distract from that, how the Trump administration is trying to distract from that. Still, no retaliation, still. Not even a statement telling, not even a statement telling Vladimir Putin to stop that. Don't do that. Cut that out. We're not going to tolerate that. They're going harder after whoever leaked the information than they are going after Vladimir Putin. So you just have to sit back and, you, you, you know, I, I've told you before, this is the traitor in chief. I told you before, Donald Trump is the first Russian president of the United States. People thought I was playing when I said that. No, I wasn't playing. I was telling the truth. Problem is, a lot of people don't want to deal with the truth. Okay? It's just like um, there was an article, and we have this, uh, I'm going to pull this article up here. There was a 30-year-old who died of coronavirus, okay? And he attended this uh, coronavirus party. He thought coronavirus was a hoax. Wonder where he got that nonsense from. And uh, he ended up dying of coronavirus. And his last words were something to the effect was, this is not a hoax. You know, where did he get nonsense like that from? Oh, coronavirus is a hoax. All these people are just dying of, what are they dying, nothing? I mean, so you, you sit back and you um, look at this nonsense that's taking place. And some of these people are following Donald Trump. Um, Donald Trump gets a test about pretty much every day. Coronavirus test. We just saw uh, he, he just wore a mask in public for the first time that uh, uh, let the media film him wearing a mask. He said he was never against wearing masks. He just had to wear it appropriately. That's not what uh, he always said dealing with masks. But the heat is on. And he, uh, he went to um, a hospital and uh, he wore a mask because it's the right thing to do, it's the responsible thing to do. Now we'll see if he continues to do that, I doubt it. Now I think he should have really done a public service and wore the mask over his entire face, but that's just me, I'm biased. So. Also, speaking of bias, all the debate going on over the Confederate monuments that are monuments to traitors to the Union. Uh, I saw a video from Vox.com, a really good video. Um, actually, uh, one of my friends, Dr. Daryl Scott, history professor at Howard University, he posted this video. I shared it on my Facebook pages. This video succinctly deals with how the uh, how Southern socialites rewrote Civil War history. How Southern socialites rewrote Civil War history, and it specifically deals with the uh, daughters of the Confederacy, the daughters of the of the Confederacy, and how they rewrote the history of the Civil War and promoted this whole myth of the lost cause. Okay, the lost cause. We're gonna get into that because that directly ties into the debates over Civil War uh, monuments. And these, we have to be clear, these are monuments to traitors to the Union. They picked, they, they took up arms against the Union and committed treason, okay? And so every Civil War monument Every school named after a quote-unquote Civil War hero. All the statues and the monuments need to be taken down and they, they should be put into uh, museums. 
All those schools need to be renamed. And even though Cass Technical High School is not named after someone who fought in the Civil War, Lewis Cass, uh, it should be renamed as well. We dealt with that last week. Lewis Cass was not just a slave owner, but he supported the institution of slavery. He was the Secretary of War for a white supremacist president named President Andrew Jackson, who did support slavery. And not only that, uh, Lewis Cass helped to carry out the Indian Removal Act of uh, 1830, which pushed the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians off their land in southeast United States and forced them over a thousand miles on what is known as the Trail of Tears. And they all go into Oklahoma and they take their African slaves with them as well. That's Lewis Cass, who Cass Technical High School is named after. So, even though he didn't commit treason against the U.S. He helped to facilitate the oppression of our ancestors. So why would we have an institution that is supposed to be too, uh, dedicated to African American excellence? Why would we have that named after a white supremacist who worked against African American excellence and worked to oppress our ancestors? People who are free, who respect themselves and respect their ancestors, don't name their institutions after their oppressors. So go and listen to last week's show, because I went deep into it, okay, as I should. And then I'm a graduate of Cass Technical High School, so I can talk, and people don't like me talking about it. You know what? I really don't give a damn. I told you that before. Anybody got a problem? Oh, you can contact me directly. We can debate. I'll debate this with anybody. I don't care. I'll debate this with anybody. So... Um, We'll talk some about the lost cause and how Southern socialites rewrote the history of the Civil War and promoted the lost cause. Uh, and then July 4th, July 4th, 1910, African-American boxer Jack Johnson beat Jim Jeffries, nicknamed the Great White Hope in a highly publicized interracial heavyweight title match fought in Reno, Nevada before 20,000 spectators. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about uh, that as well in Jack Johnson. I saw some articles dealing with Jack Johnson. Okay, so he was, uh, and, and Jack Johnson also ties into the, um, the series on Netflix, Self Made, about Madam C.J. Walker, loosely based on the uh, book that um, Lilia Bundles wrote one of her descendants because there's a scene in, in the movie that takes place in about 1910 and they are talking about Jack Johnson winning the heavyweight title and they're talking about the lynchings that they're talking about the lynchings that took place okay uh, and that's a very very important uh, piece of history because they're talking about the lynchings that took place after Jack Johnson beat Jim Jeffries and the lynchings were used as a tool to terrorize African Americans and to uh, try to keep us in our place okay because we were ecstatic when he beat Jim uh, when he beat Jim Jeffries African Americans were crazy just like when um, the brown bomber Joe Lewis used to beat um, you used to be white boxers, okay? You know, they, they put the whole race on their shoulders and that uplifted the whole race when we saw things like that take place. All right, so we'll, um, we'll discuss that also. And uh, we should be broadcasting on our... Uh, Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P, and also on 9 10 a.m., the Superstation's Facebook fan page as well. All right. So, we have a lot to uh, discuss, and we have Dr. Julian Malvo uh, coming up uh, at the bottom of the hour as well. Now, on the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now it's corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself, 
way you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the show. We deal with current events and history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. The sign up for our email newsletter. Also, uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can sign up for our email newsletter there, right on the home page at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right. Uh, so, follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network. Turn on notifications so you know when we go live. Um, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. Turn on notifications there also so you know when we go live. And you can donate to the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, and also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, uh, or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, we're coming up on a, uh, on a commercial break. We'll be back in a few minutes, and uh, we'll be joined by economist Dr. Julian Malvo in a few minutes. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation and Future Radio on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by everybody. How's everybody doing? Stand by, we're on commercial break. We'll be back in two minutes. We have Dr. Julian Malvo coming up in a few minutes here. Hope everybody's doing well. We have a lot to talk about tonight. I've been very busy working, so I can't broadcast as much as I want to. All right, let's see here. Let's pull this up. Just give me a second. I have to get ready for this next segment. All right, so got that. Stand by, everybody. Okay, we've got uh, Chast Chastity, Georgette, Leroy. There's a few of the people watching us on uh, Facebook. Stand by, we'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday. July 12, 2020, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing uh, well tonight. Okay, uh, we have Dr. Julie Malvo coming up in a, uh, a few minutes here. And uh, JT, stand by. I'm going to email you some information uh, in just a minute here. Okay, okay, we'll bring on, an, uh, let me see here, let's see here. Uh, I'll bring on a couple minutes here. Um, just one second. Okay, so Dr. Julie Malvo has long been recognized for her progressive and insightful observations. She is a labor economist, noted author, and colorful commentator. Dr. Julie Malvo has been described by Dr. Cornell West as the most iconoclastic public intellectual in the country. Her contributions to the public dialogue on issues such as race, culture, gender, and their economic impacts 
are shaping public opinion in 21st century America. Dr. Julia Malvo's popular writing has appeared in USA Today, Black, Black Issues in Higher Education, Miss Magazine, Essence Magazine, and the Progressive. And the Progressive. She's also been on the African History Network show before back in um, 2016. We were promoting the State of the Black World Conference that Dr. Ron Daniels does. And uh, she, she's fantastic. You see her periodically uh, on Roland Martin Unfiltered. And Roland's a friend of mine. You know, I used to guess those Roland's nasty syndicated uh, radio show, the Roland Martin show. Uh, so that's how. Um, when I was doing my nationally syndicated radio show as well. Uh, Dr. Julie Malvo has been a contributor to academic life since receiving her PhD in economics from MIT in 1980. She has been on the faculty or visiting faculty in the New School for Social Research, San Francisco State University, the University of California, Berkeley, College of Notre Dame, etc. She has, she, this, this sister is accomplished, intelligent. I always love to hear from her and talk to her. We want to welcome back to the African History Network show, our sister, Dr. Julian Malvo. How are you doing tonight, sister? I am wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. And keep up the no great No problem. Oh, thank you, sister. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I, last time I saw you, it was at the African Liberation Day um, celebration here in Detroit two or three years ago. And Dr. Ron Daniels was here, things like that. There was like a reparations component. I think Dr. Ray Winbush was the... Uh, keynote speaker yeah so that was the last time uh that was the last time i saw you but it's always good to uh always good to see you and hear from you and uh, we're going to pump up the volume on our end over here okay all right so you are in the uh new documentary hapi uh from director taiki grant and i've been interviewing some of the people featured in the documentary and i definitely wanted to get you on to talk about a few things but uh uh, Hapi deals with the role of economics on the development of civilization, okay? And I, I saw uh, some of your portion is excellent, but let people know, how did you uh, become involved in this project? I think that uh, Taiki had seen my work somewhere, and he, he called me, and I cut out of the blue, what help him I do? So I just said, okay. Right. Right, exactly, exactly. Let's see, let's flip this over here like that. Okay, all right. So, um, what, do, what do you think is the current state of affairs for African Americans, especially dealing with uh, economics? Because I know that's, that's, your, that's your background. Also, for the, the, also before you answer that, let me just let people know. If, if you are not familiar with Dr. Julie Malvo, if you saw the House of Representatives hearing on reparations, H.R. 40, uh, June 19th, 2019, Dr. Julia Malvo was there and she testified. She was the economist who testified, okay? So maybe if you're not familiar with her, maybe you remember the sister, okay, who threw down, that's who that is. Okay, go go ahead, sister. Um, the, the contemporary state of black folks in the economy, or, yeah, I guess so. It's that. I mean, that man in the White House, the house that enslaved people built, <laughs> he, 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 you know, loves to talk about the great economy, the great economy. And of course, last month we saw the unemployment rate drop by about, about a point and a half, which is highly unusual, but again, not unusual given that coronavirus has affected the pace of business. Right. So basically, um, May, um, people started bringing people back to work. May and June, people started bringing a few, few people back to work. But we don't know what's going to happen because several cities have now closed down. But this coronavirus hits black people mm -hmm. so much harder than us, black and brown people. So the first way it hits us is we are the so-called essential workers. Right. Black women, 21% of CNAs, certified nursing assistants, are black women. Another 21% are Latina women. So these women, respectively, in their population, roughly 6 or 7% 7, 7 of the population, but double or triple that in uh, these occupations. Flip side, black men, disproportionately involved in transportation services, bus drivers, etc. I know about the brother in Detroit that the lady just about sat on, and then he died. Mm -hmm. And so we're much more vulnerable. Occupationally, we're much more vulnerable. Right. So that's the first thing. The second thing is 
our health situation is not the same as others is. We have more health challenges, more diabetes, more high blood pressure. Um, I think more COPD as well. But in any case, I know we have more diabetes, high blood pressure. These are indicators to the COVID virus. Right. So we're more vulnerable. That's why you're seeing these high numbers of black people diagnosed and dying. Uh, and many of us have less health care or no health care. Uh, one lady I would meet, met, she said that she went to a private hospital to get the thing done. Not a, you know, because in D.C. you can get them free in some places. But she went somewhere else and they told her it was going to be $900. Um, $900? $900. So, you know, the, the virus hits us because we don't have the health care. Um, we don't have, if it's the health care, it's the pre-existing conditions. We're just harder hit. And there, there's so many other ways that we're hit. And then we have less income. Mm-hmm. Average white household has almost $70,000 in income. Average black household, barely 40, 42. So look at that. It, it, so that's how we are. The labor force, we have a higher unemployment rate than others do. Um, in fact, the unemployment rate last month was 11.7, and for us it was 18 and change. So it's not the two to one that we usually experience, but still, that's so much higher um, right. for us than it is for others. And, you know, meanwhile, that man runs around talking about the best economy you've ever had. Uh-huh. It, it, that's just objectionable, and it's just the hoodwinking, it's objecting the hoodwinked the American people. Um, so we, we, we are not doing well economically. We're slated to lose perhaps as many as 40% of our black-owned businesses. Mm-hmm. I've seen black 45. Have not had access to the, black folks haven't had access to all these funds that other people have had access to. Right. And that becomes a problem as well. So coronavirus has made us worse off, not better off. And there doesn't seem to be any mitigation for it. They weren't even trying to collect the data of who got corona until, you know, vaccine orders, of course, had to get in them. And I said, in them, not all, get in them. Mm-hmm. Tell me these data needed to be collected. But they, they don't want to know because, you know, knowledge is power. They don't want to know that our people are more heavily affected. Right. Because they have to do something about it. And, and, and what's, what's interesting, two things. Number one, um, back when you had the. A coronavirus task force press conferences when they were meeting basically every day there was it was maybe two and a half months ago something like that um, uh, uh, Surgeon General Jerome Adams talked about how uh, African Americans were disproportionately being impacted by coronavirus and the question was posed to Trump about it but he didn't talk about uh, coming up with a solution to it or addressing it and 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 they haven't addressed it so so it's very interesting because over up until up until maybe this past week this is like the first time maybe past 10 days first time they started having the coronavirus task force press conferences again but trump is pretty much declaring victory over coronavirus and that they have it under control and ignoring how it's disproportionately impacting us. Go ahead. Go ahead, sister. Go ahead. In Houston, in Florida, parts of California, in Louisiana, the cases are going up. So how has he controlled it? I mean, he doesn't pay attention. But, you know, uh, Dr. Fauci said he had not had a face-to-face with Trump in about two, two months. months. Two months, yep. And they, they yanked him. He makes more sense than anybody else. Right. Quite frankly. Right. He, he had been... Uh, Dr. Deborah Briggs, but they yanked him off television. They said he can't go on television. He used to like to go on MSNBC or Fox, well, not Fox, MSNBC or CNN. Mm-hmm. They're not letting him out there. So it's because he tells the truth. I mean, when 45 said he had it under control, now she said, no, he doesn't. He just put right just like that. No, he doesn't, because he doesn't. Right. And you're giving people false hope, and you're for young people and, and his acolytes. The little Trump acolytes, these people are not wearing masks. Um, they're not, they think this is a, a lady told me that masks were a communist plot. I said, <laughs> okay. I, okay, I just can't deal with you. 
um, then she was up on me in the store, and I asked her kindly, I said, could you please back up a little bit? I said, you, you'd have a mask on, and um, you're more than six, less than six feet away from me. She said, well, I'll move, but mask on, communist spot. I said, okay. Well, okay. you know, I, I've said before, like we, we, we see uh, on Saturday, Florida shattered its single day infection record with 15,300 new cases. We know that deaths follow the increase in cases by two to four weeks. And um, when we see that about 50 percent of these new cases are in Arizona, uh, California, Florida and Texas, um, you know, people. This is gonna be. Let me put it like this, politely. There's gonna be less people to vote for Trump. Let me put it like that, okay? Uh, Cause <laughs> when you look at what's taking place, it's like, uh, do you really want to win? I mean, <laughs> because when I say, and I, I've been, re, I've been studying coronavirus since January, just so and my listeners know this, because I was looking at what was coming. And I've studied the, pan the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, and I've done an entire presentation on that. And, all, and a lot of this stuff is history repeating itself. That killed 675,000 Americans from 1918 to 1920. Okay, 675,000 killed 50 million people worldwide. Um, how, do, how do you think the film Hapi, um, the role of economics on the development of civilization, especially your portion dealing with in, in the film Hapi. How do you think that ties into and, and will help um, African-Americans' economic conditions? First of all, the film opens up with uh, the origins. It mm -hmm. opens up with a very long piece about Egypt, about exchange in Egypt. Right. I think that's always useful to firmly locate yourself in the past. Uh, because he, because a lot of black folks don't understand what we've done. Correct. We not understand what happened in Egypt. So I think that that's uplifting. But then we start talking about things like reparations, and we talk about, um, it's, it's been so long, I forgot. Mm -hmm. But um, what else did we talk about? Um, entrepreneurship, anyway. you talk about business, entrepreneurship. Um, um, I know part of it deals with the... One thing that I explained, and Dr. Linda Jeffries and Professor Jane Small are two of my teachers personally. I've known them for years. Um, our, our history and culture gives us our, our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. And this influences our economics and our politics. So we have to have a synthesis of all three. It's not just African history and culture and speaking African languages and playing African drums. Is the economic portion and political portion. And when we study these great African civilizations, whether we talk about ancient Egypt or Kemet, whether we talk about Nubia, whether we talk about Ghana, Songhai, or Mali, they all had an economic foundation. They all controlled land. They could all grow their own food, provide for themselves. They weren't relying on uh, foreign uh, Arabs and Chaldeans or whoever to provide food for them. Right? So... When we, when we study that, and this is something that Dr. J and Professor Jane Small teach on, and I as well, we see that represented in the film Hapi. And so you brought, a, you brought an important component to it because you are actually an economist. Well, people tend to, tend to forget that the economic, and our economic history, because black people have always been placed at the periphery of this predatory capitalist economy. Right. Repeat that. The place at the periphery of a predatory capitalist economy. Right. And so um, we don't have land. We had more we had more land in nineteen ten than we do now. Almost sixteen so million. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We we um, aren't controlling the means of production much. We do have some, but a handful, maybe twenty, ten or twenty, large black companies who have you know, a large workforce. You know, but most uh, black owned businesses, I think 85 or 90 percent, are sole proprietorships. Right. Even one person. Right. So, so you know, I, as I said, I think we often forget about it. I was, that was one of the reasons that I was happy to be there because, you know, I, I will always sit down and talk about economics mm -hmm. um, and always talk about um, the way it affects our community. 
And one of the things that I think is very interesting, I've been very um, happy to see the Black Lives Matter movement and the work they're doing and, and the way that they're picking at structure. And what I would say about that is that when you look at um, economic structure, again, we're often forgotten. And so they are raising the issues. The other set of issues, they, I, I have not heard the words white supremacy spoken so many times as I have in the past two months. Right. You know? And why is that important? Because black people have more wealth if they were not white supremacy. Black, white people at one point in time, brother, you soon, they wanted your land, you got off it. Because the Dred Scott decision said blacks have no rights, their whites are bound to respect. Mm-hmm. And so they didn't respect them. So, you know, it, it, they have these towns called sundown towns. Right. I, I'm doing some work of research on them, but I think there were probably more than, there were at least a thousand. And the sundown towns that don't let your, you know what, your black, you know what, uh, be in this town after sundown. But the thing about those sundown towns was they had been, they may have been integrated before. They became sundown towns because, some, because somebody didn't like black people. Mm-hmm. Somebody didn't like black people. They said, you know, we got to get rid of these black people. They're bad influence, they're this, they're that. And that's what happened. And that happened to our people far too many times. I mean, everybody talks about Tulsa, which we should. Right. Tulsa, Tulsa Oklahoma. And, uh, mm-hmm. Where Black Wall Street was. Wilmington. Mm-hmm. Yes, and then Wilmington, of course. Right. And, um, well, but you know, when you look at these sundown towns, black, black folks would just run out of town. Many of them lost their property, or if they, or they may have to pay or buy, you know, accept less than uh, with the market value because they were running out of town and they just had to get something. So this is part of our history and legacy, and this is the economic part that, that it's painful to talk about. And you know, some of our elders um, don't want to talk about it because we're painful, right. and we have to make it possible. Uh, for, not only for folks to talk about, but for us to talk about it. Exactly. For us to talk about it. So the, yeah, because... The book I'm working on now basically does some of that, talks about some of that history. Oh, you said the book you're working on now in LK, it's going to be on Sundown Towns? No, it's going to be it's basically a black economic history, but, it, but there are aspects of the way that uh, white folks just took our stuff. Right. Oh, absolutely. And I thought I, it, Go ahead. So there are two really definitive books on Sundown Towns. Um, and, you know, one of the guys who does the work says, when you, when you look at a census, and you see one year you have five black people, next year you have five, you know something happened. Mm-hmm. And just like Black Wall Street and just like Wilmington, North Carolina, 1898, there was not a lot of ink spent on these. The newspapers were agents of silence. Right. They didn't put this in the headlines. And so many of these sundown towns, the people deny they were ever sundown towns. You know, they know the signs are gone now. You wouldn't dare have a sign up that says no, you know, in uh, mm-hmm. allowed. <laughs> right, no in words allowed, right. <laughs> Right, exactly, and 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 see this, and 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 you know, I've been doing the African History Network show for ten years in various formats. I'm a historian. These are some things that I talk about. Some of the history uh, I deal with. I, I have a two and a half hour lecture dealing with the history of Black Wall Street and the origins of Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, and the origins of Tulsa also tie into the Indian Removal Act of 1830, signed by President Andrew Jackson. Uh, and that ties into the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866 involving the Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians and those um, Africans they enslaved as well. Um, let, me, let me ask you this question here. Um, what I, I've seen a couple of articles. USA Today has one and Newsweek.com has one dealing with Representative Sheila Jackson Lee saying because of coronavirus, and how it's really exposing racial inequities and things like this and how it's disproportionately negatively impacting African Americans. This may be an opportunity to be able to push H.R. 40 through Congress, okay? Um, I know you've been working on the reparations initiative for for years, you and Dr. Ron Daniels, et cetera. Um, Where does that stand right now, H.R. 40? Is there any update you can give us? Sure. 
Um, Sheila Jackson Lee, of course, inherited the mantle from uh, Congressman, your Detroit brother, uh, John Congress. Exactly. He, of course, had, it, it had introduced reparations legislation for since 1989. Correct. Um, and we were able to get the hearing last year. Uh, Sheila Jackson Lee hopes that she will have a reparations bill to bring to the House floor mm-hmm. this session. Mm-hmm. That won't do it. So I will say that, that is unlikely to do very much because Mitch McConnell says he won't even hear it in the Senate. Correct. He, he said, he said, he said heard on the Senate. right. Just, just so people understand, I'm going to let you continue. Senator Moscow Mitch McConnell controls the Senate, okay, Republican, and he said reparations is dead on arrival in the Senate. Go, go ahead, sister. Yeah, he, so Mitch McConnell, what people did also understand, Congress right now is majority Democratic. They passed some great legislation, but the only way legislation gets passed is then it has to go to the Senate. And when the Senate marks it up or they have a conference, mm-hmm. uh, they come up with a bill that both sides can agree on, and then it goes to the Senate floor. And at that time, it then will go to uh, the president, and who has also said he won't find anything regarding reparations. Correct. So uh, I'm not saying that it's... But the more we talk about this, and the more we lift it up, the more general knowledge there is among people and the more specific knowledge there is among people. So it's a good thing, but I don't think it's going to happen um, before the election. Right, nothing's going to happen before the election. Okay. I, I saw, and, and one thing I, I explained to people is elections have consequences. And this is something yeah. that... You're living them now. Yeah, this is something that a lot of our people don't understand and it's like, why do you have to wait till, till the house burns down to realize you should have changed the battery in the smoke detector? We, we, we can't always... Well, <laughs> go, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated with the black folks who don't vote. I mean, mm-hmm. white folks don't vote, white folks don't vote either. I'm worried about that. But, you know, we do the work with the backbone of this country. We must participate. But I've heard so many specious reasons about black people don't participate. The system is, is um, one young lady told me, the system was rigged against black people. Well, yeah, but it's going to be even more rigged if you let the wrong person in office. You know, um, last election, uh, some young people told me they couldn't vote for Hillary because they didn't like her. <laughs> uh, you don't have to like her. Exactly. She come to your house. Exactly. Exactly. So w- w- what happens is is that, you know, I, I, I teach on this whole this whole concept I've created called political self-defense. Political self-defense and political self-defense deals with understanding how laws and policies impact the conditions of African-Americans, how to protect ourselves from it, how to defend against it, but also how to push our agendas as well. And what we have to understand, see, we, we lack for the most part, like political education and understanding that politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power and resources and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, the adoption, interpretation and enforcement and how politics and laws and policies impact every aspect of our life. So a lot of the issues that African-American youth or millennials are fighting for, they all deal with politics, but they don't understand the connection. No, but, and or, you know, a lot of people have been turned off by the system, made of the system, you know, the rigged system sucks, but the fact is that it's the system we have. Mm-hmm. Would I prefer a different kind of system? Absolutely. Right. This is, the one, this is the one we have. We can work to dismantle it or to repurpose it, if you will. Um, but we can't say, oh, well, I don't care, because the folks who don't care are some of the folks who need help now. Right. I mean, I ask people when, when um, they ask me about something, you know, something they perceive has happened in their life, did you vote? Did you vote? And I didn't say I would refuse to help someone who didn't vote, but I just want people to, to remind people that there are consequences to not voting. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and one of the things that's important to understand is that whoever's in office is a fiduciary over taxpayer dollars. All the policies that are implemented, whether they benefit you or not, are usually somehow paid for by taxpayer dollars. So if you pay taxes, 
Okay? Are you saying, if you pay taxes, are you saying you want somebody else managing your taxpayer dollars, somebody that you did not elect managing your taxpayer dollars? When we look at everything from the economy, so a lot of people during 2016 said, we don't need to vote, we just need to do economic empowerment and invest in the stock market. I said, that's good, but you need to vote as well because whoever's in office impacts the policies that, in, that, your, that your business operates within, the, the, the economy that your business operates within is shaped by the policies by people who are in office. And as you said a few minutes ago, it's expected that 40% and actually Black Enterprise Magazine is reporting uh, up to 45% of African American owned businesses won't survive this coronavirus economy. That, that deals with policy. That deals with politics. You know, so... Um, this, you know, the, go the, ahead. Issue, the biggest issue from this, from this term, from 45 term this time, has been taxation. Mm -hmm. Because with the tax bill that he passed, he basically gave big business lots of breaks. And most people got very little. That's public policy. How did he get that tax bill passed? He had the vote. Right, especially so, in the Senate. Myself, it, it is the most critical thing in the world to do. Just start planning now. Vote. If not in November, do the absentee ballot. You know, or vote by mail or something. But we've got to, that, I won't, it's not just about him. He's the, getting rid of him is the first step. Right. But basically, our system has been skewed from its outset and has become more skewed in the past, I'd say, 30 or so, uh, 30 or 40 years since Ronald Reagan got in office. Mm -hmm. when he started attempting to dismantle government. And that's what they always, conservatives always, we want smaller government. Right. You know, which means we don't want to help people on the bottom. You know, they don't deserve help. That's it, really implicitly what they say. Exactly. Without understanding, without understanding the flaws that um, cause people on the bottom to be on the bottom. People die on the bottom because they want to be on the bottom. Right. When you have predatory capitalism, when you, ha when you have not raised the minimum wage in 10 years, I mean, there are going to be some people on the bottom. Exactly. And, and all that deals with policies, that deals with politics. Politics impacts every aspect of our life, from the water we drink to the air we breathe to the food we eat. Um, when you, let's see here, we're, we're coming up on break in about four minutes. Um, you talked about the, 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 tax, the tax cut, uh, Trump's $1.4 trillion tax cut that gave 83% of the benefits to the top 1% and added almost two trillion dollars to the national debt that republicans are not paying down they've they've run up the national debt now it's really close to five trillion since trump has been in office when you add in the the bills that congress had to pass to deal with coronavirus it's close to something like five trillion they've added to the national debt um but th once again this deals with politics when we deal with the attorney general okay in this role Lawless Attorney General, Attorney General William Barr, uh, and what they're doing is deals with politics. What? So on, on this show, I have dealt with um, Joe Biden's 22-page um, Black Agenda, or you know, Agenda for African Americans, and it's in six right. parts. It's in six parts. Each week, I broke down. I went through and broke down one part. We did that for six weeks here on this show. Because uh, I hear people, I hear a whole lot of our people saying we want a black agenda, we want a black agenda from the candidates, things like this, but then they don't go read it. But that's a whole other conversation. Um, what, what Did you get a chance to read uh, Joe Biden's 22-page uh, agenda? I read through it. I didn't do what you did and calculate everything, but I did read, read through it. It's a, it's a very decent start. I'm not going to say mm -hmm. good, but I'll say it's a very decent start. Right. That's a good thing. Um, is it the end of the, you know, does it transform our communities? No, but it, make, it will probably make them a little bit better. Um, I, I, I think he means well. I think, you know, Pete Buttigieg had an um, economic plan mm -hmm. that well. The Frederick Douglass plan. The issue, there, are three, there are three things here. First of all, what's the quality of the plan? Um, secondly, when you have the votes who pass it, aspects of the place. In, in Congress, yeah, because a lot of it has to pass through Congress. Congress and the Senate, and the Senate. Well, yeah, yeah. The House and the Senate. Both chambers of Congress, yeah. So, the, so, so the, that's the second piece of the you have. And number three, are people prepared to push for this? 
Mm-hmm. Not just Biden or anybody else, but who else is prepared to push for this? Right, because, right. You know, so, so I, again, I've seen so many economic plans, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm not just in the effort because I know some people who worked on it. I think they worked hard. I think they worked well. But at the same time, I think that we need, and this is the best we can do in an in election. You mm-hmm. can't make the public policy. Now, I must tell you that Joe Biden has um, really shown himself to be, a very, a, you know, basically a sensible man, a good guy. Um, mm-hmm. He's made some mistakes in the past, and everybody knows about him. But the fact is, right now, I think he's doing some of the right things. And I think when he has talked about, has talked about the coronavirus and, and chided Mr. Trump for his cavalier behavior, we need somebody to do that. Somebody say, dude, look, people are dying. We're up to a hundred and more than 130,000 deaths in the United States. Yeah, about 135,000, yep. And, you know, this man is going to Mar-a-Lago and uh, having rallies in Tulsa and, it's just, you know, just doing things that are insensible, but also at some level giving the black community the middle finger. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and people can go to, uh, I, I, well, first of all, we're coming up on a break here. Uh, you got a few more minutes. I'm going to hold you over the break for a few minutes. Yeah, I can, I can wait a few more minutes. Okay. Um, read the article, everybody read the article from Black Press USA, uh, blackpressusa.com. You've heard me talk about it before. Joe Biden's plan for empowering black America. This came out May 5th, 2020. And you can go back and, and listen to our, our podcast. Uh, because I went through and thoroughly uh, broke down this plan. Pages 2 through 11 deal with economic empowerment, policies dealing with economic empowerment for African Americans. Uh, and, and, and the Biden campaign calls this a living document, meaning that they're going to add to it. They're calling this a living document, and people should understand this is a floor, not a ceiling, but we have to be focused on pushing our issues and policies through the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate and getting it signed into law by a president. Okay, so stand by, Dr. Julian Malvo. Um, you listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, July 12th, 2020. And we are live. We're speaking with uh, our sister economist, Dr. Julian Malvo. Uh, you've seen her on MSNBC, seen her on CNN. You see her on Roland Martin Unfiltered. And we share Roland's uh, show live here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network as well. Uh, okay, Dr. Julian Malvo, uh, welcome back, sister. Um, right before the break, we were talking about um, Joe Biden's plan for black America, and we were talking about reparations and things like that. Uh, so what being that you are well first of all let me ask this question explain to people exactly what is an economist because some people don't know and you know what what is an economist well e- economics is a study of who gets what when where and why very yep. much like politics but with a numerical component to it economists are people who study flows of goods and services. Right. Uh, and they could be agricultural goods and services. It could be stocks and bonds. It could be labor. I'm a labor economist. I study the workplace and how people deal and how people are fair in the workplace. Um, but basically, economists are looking at resource allocation. Mm-hmm. Who gets what, when, where, and why. Okay, excellent. So that's, that's the Cliff Notes version. Yeah, and I've, you know, I'm my degrees in business administration, so I'm not an economist, but we had to study, we had to take economics, and we had to take economics before we could take our lowest level um, business class, which was, I think, marketing 430 or something like that, intro marketing class. Um, so, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, economics. So, let me, let me ask you this question. La- on last week's show, I dealt with uh, this study from the Washington Post dealing with black families pay significantly higher property taxes than white families. New analysis shows 
unfair property assessments lead to widespread overtaxation of black Americans homes. And this, and they're talking about how this led to foreclosures, but this is historic. This is one of the tools that was used to steal our land from us. Okay. Talk, talk, talk about that for a minute. And then what should African Americans be doing now to empower ourselves economically and try to reverse this stuff that's going on? Well, first, we need to be economically literate. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to be able to ask questions. Um, never accept the first price. Someone, you know, oftentimes, for example, black women tend to get um, pay higher interest on car loans mm -hmm. than others do. So one might ask why, and of course, white men are going to bargain, bargain and bargain hard. Oftentimes, auto dealers don't want to deal with women bargaining. But you never take the first, can you do better? Or oh, I saw this car at down the street for less. So you, you go, forewarned is forearmed. You go in there prepared, you know, prepared for battle. And I mean, I'm, I'm not exaggerating with some of these things. It is battle. Right. If you can save, you know, if you can save even a thousand dollars, that's battle. So you just doesn't do it. Um, and a lot of us don't want to, can't, whatever. But that's, you know, so we're basically harming ourselves. So the first thing is to be very educated about every aspect of the economy. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it gets to be facile about public policy. What, it's like the tax bill. Uh, what was in it? Why, why did the rich get all the money? Right. There are so many other, why has the minimum wage not been raised in 10 years? Mm -hmm. So $7.25 an hour, just like it was in, 19, in 2010. I think we got a little bit of a bump, but not much of a bump. No, it's been the same thing for since you know, ten years. That's ten, since two years, when 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 Democrats control both the House and the Senate, yeah, that was the last time it was increased uh, to seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour. Yep, go go ahead. But anyway, so I so the, the second thing is to be you know to be literate, literate to be faithful in public policy. Then three, make sure your personal finances are together. You know, check your credit score regularly. Not only check your credit score, you know, just check, make sure you're saving what you think you're saving, investing what you think you're investing. Don't be afraid to ask for help. But you know, even if we were a thousand percent perfect, and all, many of us are not, you, you have credit card debt, you have this, you have that. But even if we were perfect, we still wouldn't close a wealth gap. Cleaning up your finances is an act of personal empowerment. And I, and I applaud anyone who does that. We also have to think and talk about community empowerment. Okay. Community empowerment. And with empower community, that's where the reparations conversation comes from. It's okay. about community empowerment. Reparations conversation is not about cut everybody a check. Right. I mean, there may be individual reparations, and that would be a good thing. But we're also talking about repairing a community that essentially was deliberately underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. Deliberately underdeveloped. Repairing the damage. And the reason it was underdeveloped is because it allowed majority people to make firm profits on the backs of minority people. Right. Right. Exactly. Repairing the damage that was done. And, uh, one, one of the, one of the best examples I've seen of this, and I'm not, are, are you familiar with the black Freedmen Indian treaties of 1866? Oh yeah. Okay. And, and and that and that right there the the remedy that uh because you had African Americans that were former slaves of those of the, what were called the five civilized tribes of Native Americans, the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee and Seminole Indians. And um those families are going to get land, they're going to get citizenship into those Native American nations, they get free taxes. It's benefits that they is benefits that they get from that, okay? And even though um many of us illegally got pushed out of those treaties in 1941 when the uh, those Native American nations and the U.S. government conspired together to, re to re restructure what a Native American is. And they said you need one quarter Native American blood or one quantum Native American blood, blood and originally you didn't have to have that. Um, that right there serves as some type of example of some type of comprehensive um remedy okay some some copy comprehensive uh repairing 
of of the damage. There could be more in it. And, you know, they got things like free college tuition, free taxes, uh, not property taxes, apparently, um, because Sarah Rector had to pay property taxes on her land there in Oklahoma. OK, and Sarah Rector, you familiar with Sarah Rector? I'm not, no. Okay, Sarah Rector, I'll send you an article on Sarah Rector. Sarah Rector was known as the richest Afro-American girl in the country. This was the early 1900s. She lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and her family was of former enslaved Creek Indian ancestry. Her family were African-Americans who were enslaved by the Creek Indians. And her, her family gets land because of those black freeman indian treaties okay and oil is discovered on her land and she becomes a millionaire she's like 13 years old her name is sarah rector r-e-c-t-o-r so when i teach on black wall street and teach on this history i talk about sarah rector because that a lot of the early african-american landowners in tulsa because tulsa was founded by creek indians around 1834 1836 um, a lot of those early African-American landowners get land because of those treaties. And then that plays into the history of the Greenwood District and all of that. OK, um, it, let people know how they can get your books and read your writings and things like that. Uh, my Web page is julianmalvo.com. That's J-U-L-I-A-N-E. Mm-hmm. M-A-L-B-E-A-U-X, all one word, dot com. Okay. That's where my website is. Okay. And they can get your books. I know you wrote one book dealing with President Barack Obama. Uh, I think it was like 2016, something like that. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And then you have. There's still a few copies that I left. And then, the, you know, my, my, my little love note, I call it love note to my people, called um, Surviving and Thriving 365 Days in Black Economic History. Right, right. Okay. And I know like when you when you're on Roller Martin Unfiltered and things like that, I know you like to call uh <laughs> I know you like to call Donald Trump the orange orangutan, but I just want to say I think that's disrespectful to orangutans to associate him with the uh, orangutan. <laughs> I, I said that many times. I don't mean to insult orangutan. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right, sister. Well, look, I, I appreciate appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Once again, um, Dr. Julie Malvo is featured in the documentary Hop He. Hop He deals with uh, the role of economics on the development of civilization, visit the website hapifilm.com, H-A-P-I, hapifilm.com. Uh, the world premiere is July 18th, 2020, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time online. You can get tickets at hapifilm.com. The film also features Dr. Linda Jeffries, Professor Jane Small, Dr. Wade Noble, Dr. Patricia Newton, and others. So we'll have some more of the uh, people featured in uh, that documentary uh, here on the African History Network show. Visit the website hapifilm.com film.com. All right, Dr. Julie Malvo, you have a fantastic uh, evening, sister, and we'll talk soon, okay? You too, and have a blessed week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, everybody, that was uh, Dr. Julie Malvo, economist. She's actually an economist, and a lot of people pretend to be an economist. No, she's, she has a PhD in economics. She's actually an economist, okay? So just so people don't get confused, all right, because a lot of people like to talk about economics, but they're not economists, all right, so we bring the experts on this show as well. Okay, 313-778-7600, 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. Um, these, the podcast of this show, will we'll have it available. Well, it, it's on our, it'll be on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. And uh, we should be broadcasting on YouTube right now. I know we're on Facebook. Um, so let's see. We're coming up here on a break in a few minutes. Um, let's do this here. And I, I have to, JT, I got to send you some information. So we'll deal with this on the other side of the break. I, I could probably play this. I'm running through my mixer, my 12 channel mixer, so I can probably play this through the mixer. Everybody should be able to hear it, but uh, let me see. Let me just try, I'm not sure. We'll, we'll check with JT, see if I can do that. But uh, let's talk about Blackout Day, right? Uh, uh, on the other side of the break, we'll deal with um, 
the Confederacy and how uh, socialites rewrote the history of the Civil War. This ties right into the Confederate monuments. We'll talk some about, uh, uh, give you an update on what's going on with coronavirus. 69,000 new cases in one day uh, on Friday, um, uh, uh, June 10th. Uh, was set by the U.S. and then also on Saturday, Florida records 15,300 uh, new cases in one day. But Blackout Day took place uh, on Tuesday, okay, this past Tuesday. The Griot.com had a good article uh, uh, dealing with this. Uh, black business owners are taking to social media to speak out about the boost in support they saw on Blackout Day. Now, an earlier report published by the griot.com noted that July 7th was designated as a day of solidarity uh, in America where African Americans were urged to support African American owned businesses only. Uh, the griot.com has an article entitled Black Owned Businesses See Sales Boost from Blackout Day. Black Owned Businesses See Sales Boost from Blackout Day. So uh, on the website uh, for Blackout Day, it said this movement is an awakening of the national consciousness of black people in America and abroad. We need economic solidarity in America amongst all black people unequivocally. Now, the mission statement goes on to note, quote, in order to break free from the chains of financial civility, we will organize uh, we will organize days, weeks, months, and years, if necessary, when not one black person in America will spend a dollar outside of our community. All right, now there was a flyer that was circulating around and it had, the flyer contradicted like the official statements from the website because I went to the website and, and well, the website was down when I went, the, the website on the flyer was down. So I, I looked at the article from um, news1.com and the Grio, and it was saying to, um, spend only spend dollars with businesses in your community, specifically African American, basically African American owned businesses. Okay, saying only spend dollars in your community is tricky because some businesses in our community are not owned by African Americans. So, the correct language would probably be only spend dollars with African American owned businesses. Uh, there was a flyer that was circulating that said, um, "Do not spend any money on July 7th." The Black Lives Matter movement is holding a nationwide economic blackout. Black people account for 1.2 trillion in annual U.S. spending. With just one day of no spending by POC, people of color and allies, we could keep billions out from the economy. Money talks, let's speak their language. Okay, but so that, I, I don't know who did that flyer. That flyer contradicts what the overall message was about recirculating, recir recycling dollars amongst our own businesses. Okay. So the, the, so when you organize things like this, you have to make sure that you have a clear, coherent message. You have to make sure you have a clear, coherent message. Okay. Uh, if we, the article goes on to say, according to Hollywood Life, the movement was conceived by Calvin Martyr, M-A-R-T-Y-R, founder of the Blackout Coalition. Uh, Martyr explains that African Americans account for $1.2 trillion in economic spending. Blackout Day is meant to demonstrate the economic power that black people have in America. Celebrities and athletes, including Rihanna, Tristan Thompson, and Cardi B, took to social media to support the uh, movement and encourage their massive following to hashtag buy black on Blackout Day. And I've said this before, Blackout Day should not be a day that we focus on not spending dollars with other people, that should be a day we focus on spending dollars with our own people, with our own businesses. Black in day, not black out, black in. Now, rapper T.I. made clear in an Instagram post that there should be, quote, one day of solidarity in America when not one black person in America spends a dollar, end quote. Okay, now the focus is not on not spending a dollar. The focus, see, we spend too much time focusing on trying to send a message to white people as opposed to trying to send a message to our own people. The focus should be on recycling our dollars in our own, with our, among our own businesses and strengthening our businesses. Because if you read the article that we've talked about from Black Enterprise, it's estimated that 45% of African-American owned businesses won't survive the next six months because of the coronavirus economy. So the call to action 
certainly seems to have paid off. The article from thegrio.com says Khadija Robinson, founder of Nile, N-I-L-E, which is a digital community that connects shoppers with black owned brands online, saw a 200 percent surge in users on Tuesday uh, per uh, CNBC.com. CNBC.com reported on this uh, quote. We are seeing an influx of interest and there's been a growing interest in the movement to support black businesses for several years. She said people are really trying to uh, be more conscientious, conscientious, conscientious um, uh, with their shopping uh, and support the small minority and women owned brands and finding our tool really useful in terms of uh, really useful in terms of facilitating that. Now, they see there's a tweet from uh, DJ Young Vernon, a young hip hop African American. Uh, in the article, he tweeted on July 3rd, 2020, I own a black owned, uh, I think I said June 10th, let's say, did I say June 7th, it's, it's July, it was July uh, 7th, this took place. Uh, he said, I own a black owned alternative uh, culture shop that sells records, comics, arts, toys, anime, and uh, magna toys. If y'all know anyone that's interested in these things and want to support a small business instead of Amazon, tag them or just we or just a retweet would help. Uh, that's in the article from the Grio. Now, uh, Khadija Robinson launched her website March 1st, 2020, and now has 1900 brands on the platform. The timely website comes amid reports that African American owned businesses have been greatly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, making blackout day even more vital to recovery efforts. African American owned businesses took to social media on blackout day to post discount codes, which helped drive sales. Uh, quote, anytime you can bring in new customers to black owned businesses, it's a great time, said Michael uh, De, uh, De Los Santos, owner of Mike D's BBQ Barbecue in Durham, North Carolina. He saw a 280 percent increase in daily sales average on Tuesday. And then uh, the article goes on to say, what I hope is that it isn't just a one time thing where folks in this moment are going to support black businesses right now because it's popular. I hope it's a sustainable thing where folks can adjust their buying habits for the long haul. Now, this is where the foundation, our history and culture comes into play. African history and culture gives you your values, your interests, and your principles. It gives us our self-esteem, our self-development, our self-worth. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you've been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Okay, we're coming up on a break. Uh, you listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation Future Radio. All right. So it's Sunday, uh, July 12, 2020. And um, we were joined by our sister, uh, Dr. Julian Malvo, in the first hour uh, of the show. Also, um, right before the break, we were talking about um, Blackout Sunday, uh, Blackout Tuesday, I should say. Blackout Tuesday, thegrio.com has a good article uh, dealing with uh, Blackout Tuesday, and uh, I want to, I'm, I'm going to send this uh, to uh, JT. I'm going to email you this clip here. Um, I, I want to talk some about this whole controversy dealing with the Confederate monuments. And you've heard me talk about this before. Uh, I'm totally against the I'm totally against people taking it upon themselves to tear down Confederate monuments and activists to tear them down. Every Confederate monument, every Confederate statue needs to be removed. It should go into a museum. OK, now with Stone Mountain in Georgia, you can't put that in a museum. It's too it's too tall. It's a mountain. OK, they need to redo that because that has the uh, images that has the carvings of. Um, Jefferson Davis, who was the president of the Confederacy, General Robert E. Lee, and uh, Thomas Stonewall Jackson on it, three traitors to the Union, okay? But we also have to ask the question, how 
do people get the history of the Confederacy so wrong? Why are they honoring traitors to the Union? Okay, now I can understand why Donald Trump honors traitors to the Union because he's a traitor himself. I told you Donald Trump was the first Russian president of the United States. People um, thought I was playing when I said that. And we saw that he just gave a commutation to a traitor named Roger Stone. Um, it, that was on Friday. We know NBCnews.com reported Trump commutes Roger Stone's prison sentence after he was convicted of covering up for the president, Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump on Friday, um, July 10th, Friday, July 10th, commuted the prison sentence of former campaign aide Roger Stone, sparing his longtime advisor from having to report to prison next week. Quote, Roger, Donald Trump said Roger Stone has suffered already. Uh, the White House said in a statement, he very unfairly and was, as very many others in this case, Roger Stone is now a free man. Um, so, you know, there's so much wrong with this. Um, and you have a lot of uh, Republican senators who uh, I said on last week's show, whatever punishment Donald Trump pays, these these Republican senators that aided and abetted him like Susan Collins and Senator Lamar Alexander and, and Senator Ted Cruz and Senator Spineless Lindsey Graham of South Carolina. Um, they, they should pay this, the same penalty as well because they had an opportunity in early February 2020 to remove Donald Trump from office. And uh, they didn't do it. OK, they didn't do it. So they should. Uh, whatever penalty he pays or, or what have you, they should pay the same penalty. And every last one of them needs to be voted out of office. Uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, Moscow, Mitch McConnell, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, Little uh, uh, little little Marco Rubio down in Florida. He's not up for re-election November third, twenty twenty. Uh, Senator Ted Cruz. All of them. All these traitors need to be voted out of office. But the announcement came shortly after a federal appeals court denied Roger Stone's emergency motion to delay his July fourteenth surrender date. OK, so he was supposed to uh, report to prison. He's a convicted felon. He's still a convicted felon. His conviction is on his is on his little record. OK, uh, Roger Stone, uh, Roger Stone's lawyer, Robert Bushel, B-U-S-C-H-E-L, told NBC News, quote, we are grateful and relieved and glad this nightmare is over, end quote. Another of Roger Stone's attorneys, Grant Smith, said his client is, quote, incredibly honored that President Trump used his awesome and unique power under the Constitution of the United States for this act of mercy. But if you give a commutation for corrupt purposes, that's illegal. Like if you give a commentation to somebody who has the goods on you and uh, you're, you're afraid that uh, they, uh, they're going to spill the beans and tell the truth about you, uh, that's illegal. OK, so uh, we, 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 we have to uh, keep that in mind as well. You're going to hear more about this now. Asked early on Friday if he planned on intervening in Roger Stone's case, Donald Trump said, I'll be looking at it. I think Roger Stone was very unfairly treated, as were as were many people. End quote. Um, so we a lot of people knew this was coming. Uh, Donald Trump had been telegraphing this um, previously. Now, Washington Post has an article also dealing with this Trump commute sentence of confidant uh, Roger Stone, who was convicted of lying to Congress and witness tampering, convicted of lying to Congress and witness tampering. While the commutation was celebrated by Trump's most stalwart supporters, the muted response by Republican lawmakers and Roger Stone's uh, own history as a self-described dirty trickster indicated that the president's decision to interfere with the nation's justice system could be fraught with political risk. Uh, Donald Trump, who has declared himself the president of law and order, it should be lawless, lawlessness and disorder. Donald Trump is the president of lawlessness and disorder and the first Russian president of the United States. So 
Um, he's called himself the president of law and order in recent weeks. He used his unique presidential authority to undermine the unanimous finding of a jury that Roger Stone broke the law multiple times by lying to Congress and obstructing justice. Now, for a president who sparked a special counsel probe by firing an FBI director in the middle of an investigation and was later impeached for attempting to pressure a foreign government to investigate his political rival, Joe Biden, the move to grant Roger Stone clemency underscored his continued willingness to disrupt the nation's legal and political norms just months before an election. Um, now, while the 643 page statement recited, a so look, Kaylee Mc, uh, uh, McEnany, who is um, Donald Trump's press sec secretary, and she's really a blonde Stepford wife. OK, she goes out there every day and just lies. I see the White House press conference. I mean, these the, 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 I mean, she's all she's almost worse than uh, uh, Sarah Huckabee. OK, the wicked witch of the West Wayne, Sarah Huckabee. Kelly McEnany is is almost as she may be even worse because her first day as White House press secretary. She lied to the press and said, I will never lie to you. That was a lie. Kaylee McEnany said in a statement Friday that ended with the exclamation, Roger Stone is a free man with an exclamation point. She said, Roger Stone is a victim of the Russia, Russia hoax that left that the left and his allies and the media perpetuated for years in an attempt to undermine the Trump presidency. Now, while the 643 uh, word statement recited a litany of Trump supporters complaints about Roger Stone's unfair prosecution, arrest and trial, including several complaints about the media, the commutation leave Roger Stone's conviction standing, unlike a presidential pardon which would have absolved the GOP operative of wrongdoing, the White House action only lifted Roger Stone's punishment, a 40-month prison sentence that uh, was to begin on Tuesday. Okay? Uh, so the, now, check this out. Now, I find this very interesting. The reason why they said that they, why Trump gave a commutation of the, of the Roger Stone, the White House cited Roger Stone's age, 67, saying he would be a medical risk in prison while he continued his appeals. Roger Stone, quote, maintained, because they cited the co uh, coronavirus. They cited coronavirus. Look at the hypocrisy of this. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, Donald Trump was talking about ending the federal funding for coronavirus testing centers in places like Texas and other places that ha have seen an increase in cases. We know in Arizona, people are having to wait five, six, seven, eight, nine hours in line to get a coronavirus test. And, and, and then they have to wait days for the results. So you're talking about removing federal funding for coronavirus testing. While at the same time, a convicted criminal like this, you say he should not go to prison because of a fear of coronavirus. Yet you don't want to properly fund coronavirus testing. You say that somebody who has the goods on you should not go to prison because of fear of coronavirus and they're older and they could get coronavirus, while at the same time, you don't want to properly fund coronavirus testing. Then on top of that, you want to pressure governors to send children back to school come the fall and coronavirus numbers are steadily increasing across the country. And we're seeing, we're, we're seeing increases. We're seeing records being broken day after day after day. This is an example of how elections have consequences. As I told you before, this November 3rd, 2020 election is liter literally about life or death. This is literally about life or death. Now, Democrats quickly slammed the decision by Donald Trump to give a commutation to his criminal friend. How, how does Donald Trump know so many criminals? I'm just curious, what type of people are you hanging around that know so many criminals? Roger Stone, Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, Paul Manafort. What type of people is he hanging around? But birds of a feather flock together. 
Michael Cohen. Michael, Michael Cohen got picked up. Michael Cohen's, Cohen's back in jail. His, his former longtime attorney, Michael Cohen, who got released from prison because of coronavirus. Democrats quickly slammed the decision as yet another instance of Trump's undermining the nation's justice system by protecting his friends and seeking to punish his enemies, protecting his friends and seeking to punish his enemies. Richard, Richard Nixon wasn't even this corrupt, as corrupt as Richard Nixon was. He wasn't even this corrupt. Read the rest of this article here from um, Washington Post. Trump commutes sentence of confidant Roger Stone, who was convicted of lying to Congress and witness tampering. OK. And. Um, um, Candace Owens needs to debate you. It's Candace Owens can bring her ass on here anytime. I'll debate Candace Owens. Candace Owens don't want none of me and she don't want she she doesn't want to debate uh, uh, Roland Martin either. Candace Owens is very ignorant of history. So if she want to bring her ass on here, we, you know, we'll get her some black hair care products before she comes on so she can touch up those edges. Um, uh, let's see here. Okay, then Robert Mueller broke his silence over a year. He wrote an op-ed article for the Washington Post. Mueller breaks his silence to defend Russia investigation and stone prosecution. Read this article July 11th, 2020 from the Washington Post. Uh, the former special counsel Robert Mueller III broke a nearly year-long silence Saturday to defend his office's press prosecution of Roger Stone and his larger investigation of the 2016 Trump campaign, writing an op-ed piece to publicly push back against attacks from the president and his supporters. The piece... Uh, which appears in Sunday's Washington Post is a remarkable departure from Robert Mueller's self-imposed silence as the political debate surrounding his work has continued to rage more than a year after the uh, after he concluded his investigation of Russia's interference in the last presidential election. And it underscores the degree to which the cases Mueller brought have been undone or undermined by the Trump administration and others because Donald Trump, with the help of his henchmen, Attorney General William Barr, are trying to totally erase the findings and the convictions from the Mueller investigation. This is what this is what this is all about. OK, and they're trying to uh, they're trying to do this before the November 3rd, 2020 election. But keep in mind, Donald Trump is an impeached president because he tried to shake down a uh, new Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, in the July 25th, 2019 call to try to get them to launch an investigation into Joe Biden and his son, Hunter Biden. OK, so this is this whole thing right here is. I mean, I've never seen corruption like this, not in America, other, other, other countries. We've never seen corruption like this. This is unprecedented. So Mueller's 700-word piece recounts the high-stakes investigation that consumed the White House for the better part of two years, resulting in convictions of a number of Donald Trump's confidants, including Roger Stone. Trump. Um, now, in announcing the commutation, the White House issued a lengthy statement blasting Mueller's work. Mueller, in turn, used this highly uncharacteristic public statement to remind the public, remind the public what his investigation found. OK, and they lie in, in the statement from Kelly McEnany, in the statement from the White House, they lied, blatantly lied and said Mueller's investigation totally exonerated Donald Trump. No, it did not. That's a blatant lie. Quote, we now have a detailed picture of Russia's interference in the 2016 presidential election. Robert Mueller wrote, quote, we also identified numerous links between Russian government, between the Russian government and between the Russian government and Trump campaign personnel, Roger Stone among them. We did not establish that members of the Trump campaign, quote unquote, conspired with the Russian government in his activities. The re now, the, the term conspire is very important. You've heard me talk about this before. I encourage people to read the uh, Mueller report also. And I've got my copy of it right here. Because on uh, in the Mueller report, 
they talked about how they did not investigate uh, collusion. Collusion is not a legal term. Okay, they investigated criminal conspiracy. All right, now criminal conspiracy deals with, and, and, and he, he made it clear in volume one, page two, uh, Muller said, but collusion is not a specific offense or theory of liability found in the United States code, nor is it a term of art in federal criminal law. OK, for those reasons, the office's focus in analyzing questions of joint criminal liability was on conspiracy as defined in federal law, conspiracy as defined in federal law. So they're dealing with criminal conspiracy in connection with uh, that analysis. We address the uh, factual question whether members of the Trump campaign, quote unquote, coordinated a term that appears in the appointment order with Russian election interference activities like collusion, quote unquote, coordination does not have a settled definition in federal criminal law. OK, we understood coordination to require an agreement tacit or expressed between the Trump campaign and the Russian government on election interference. We understood coordination to require an agreement, an agreement either tacit or expressed between the Trump campaign and the Russian government on election interference. That requires more than two parties taking actions that were informed by or responsive to others' actions or interests. So when you go look at this, um, they're saying that they could not find an agreement between the Trump campaign and the Russians. They cannot find an agreement either tacit or implied. Doesn't mean the agreement didn't exist, but then they go on to lay out how the Trump campaign welcomed help from Russia's and the 140 contacts between Trump campaign personnel and Russians. So, uh, you know, you've heard me talk about this before. And those who listen to the show regularly and heard me cover the impeachment and the Mueller report and things like this, right? If a bank robbery takes place and you see four people, suspects, coming to the bank basically at the same time, basically dressed the same, they rob the bank. They go in the same direction and get into the same car. Do you have to see an agreement, either tacit or express, to realize they're working together? Are we to assume that they all got into the same Uber at the same time? Or is it reasonable to come to the conclusion, mm, they're probably working together? We don't have to see an agreement tacit or expressed between them to come to that conclusion. It's pretty safe to assume they're working together. So Robert Mueller went on to say, we did not establish that members of the Trump campaign conspired with the Russian government in its activities. The investigation did, however, establish that the Russian government perceived it would benefit from a Trump presidency. The Russian government would benefit from a Trump presidency and work to secure that outcome. The Russian government worked to secure helping Donald Trump become president. It also established that the campaign expected it would benefit electorally from information stolen and released through Russian efforts. End quote. Now, in asserting that Roger Stone had links to the Russian government, Robert Mueller appears to reference private messages. The political consultant, Roger Stone, who also was a good friend of Richard Nixon, and he was a campaign advisor, Richard Nixon. And Roger Stone has a tattoo of Richard Nixon's face between Roger Stone's shoulder blades. What kind of, what kind of relationship they had? I don't know. I mean, I don't, uh, okay, um, whatever. These type of people Trump hangs out with. Okay. Now it also established that the campaign expected it would benefit electorally from information stolen and released through Russian efforts. End quote. Now, in asserting Roger Stone had links, links to the Russian government, Robert Mueller appears to reference private messages that Roger Stone 
and longtime Trump friend, uh, a longtime Trump friend, had with an online persona known as Guccifer 2.0 in August of 2016. Now, U.S. officials have said Guccifer 2.0 was not the Romanian hacker he claimed to be, but a front created by Russian intelligence agents a front created by Russian intelligence agents. Roger Stone said at the time that he did not believe Guccifer 2.0 was Russian. Now, the debate about Roger Stone's role in 2016, what he really knew and who he was really talking to is one of the lingering mysteries that Robert Mueller's investigators were never able to fully solve. Okay, never able to fully solve. The, the known interactions between uh, Stone and the anti-secrecy group WikiLeaks. Donald Trump said, I love WikiLeaks. Donald Trump mentioned WikiLeaks about 160 times in the last 30 days of the 2016 campaign. Then after he stole the election with the help of Russia through and, and, and won it in the Electoral College, because most people don't understand how the Electoral College works and don't realize that it's not the popular vote nationally that matters is the popular vote per state that matters. That's why Republicans engage in a, in, in a voter suppression campaign to suppress the vote in key battleground states like Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. And Donald Trump won Michigan by 10,704 votes. And Jill Stein got 50,000 votes out of Michigan. Still don't understand what the hell that was about. Well, I know what it was about, but I don't understand why people voted for Jill Stein. Uh, I know what that was about because I told you about it then. And I told you about it afterwards, especially when we deal with the picture of Jill Stein at the Russia Today uh, anniversary in uh, 2015. And she's sitting at Vladimir Putin's table in Russia at the anniversary of Russia Today TV and sitting next to Vladimir Putin is Lieutenant General Michael Flynn. And Lieutenant General Michael Flynn became Donald Trump's first national security advisor who got, who, who got exposed and Trump had to fire him and Trump hired him, even though President Barack Obama told Donald Trump, don't hire this guy because I had to fire him. That Lieutenant General Michael Flynn. Yeah, that just, yeah. Okay, Mr. Law and Order. No, this is lawlessness and disorder. I told you he's the first Russian president of the United States, but, you know, okay, whatever. Um, WikiLeaks suggests he was trying to find out what sort of hacked Democratic emails might be made public and when, but the digital trail also suggests those efforts may have been largely unsuccessful. Now, in the summer of 2016, Roger Stone claimed to have a conduit conveying him information from WikiLeaks, but the group denied it and the, and the people Roger Stone talked to about it told investigators they never had those kinds of conversations with WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange or anyone close to him. This is a very important question we should ask here. What happened to the emails that Russians stole from the Republican National Committee. Why weren't those emails released through WikiLeaks? Oh, there were emails stolen. Because see, in January of 2017, uh, FBI Director James Comey testified in front of the U.S. Senate. CNN has an article about this, and they have the video of the testimony. FBI director, then FBI director James Comey said that the Russians didn't just hack the Democratic National Committee, their emails, they also hacked the RNC. They, what they did was they hacked old email addresses of the RNC, but they never released the emails. Listen to me. They never released the emails the WikiLeaks, only the emails from the Democrats. So that causes me to sit back and think and understand compromise, compromising information, compromise. 
Is it possible that there was damaging information in those emails regarding those Republicans in Congress, Republicans in the U.S. Senate, Republicans in the U.S. House of Representatives, and Russians are holding that over these Republicans' head as, as, as leverage to get them to do certain things, take certain votes, just do things that just don't make any damn sense whatsoever? Is that possible? I think it is. I think it's highly possible. Very few people talk about that. Very few people talk about that. I wonder why. I wonder why more people aren't talking about that. Um, let's see here. Let me let me pull this clip up. Hey JT, you 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 have the the um, you have the first clip. You got that clip I sent you. Um, let's let's do this, man. I'm going to try to email you this clip here. Um, all right, you know what? We'll say this. We'll say this clip for next week. Or oh, I'll play this after the show. Um, let, let, let's go to this clip. Uh, let's go to the clip here. Uh, let's go to clip one. This deal, everybody. This deals with how socialites rewrote the history of the Civil War. Let's go to this clip. Textbook describes slavery. The master often had a barbecue or a picnic for his slaves. Then they had a great frolic. Even while working in the cotton fields, they sang songs. The beat of the music and the richness of their voices made work seem light. Yikes. That's from History of Georgia, a textbook published in 1954 that was taught across junior high schools in Georgia for decades. That sort of language is part of an intellectual movement called the Lost Cause, a distorted version of American Civil War history that's been prevalent in the South for a long time. It took shape soon after the defeat of the Confederate States in the war, when Southern historians like Edward Pollard and former Confederate General Jubal Early started preserving the South's perspective through their writings. They framed the Confederate cause as a heroic defense of the Southern way of life against the overwhelming forces in the North. That narrative has a few basic tenets. The glorification of Confederate soldiers who died for a cause they believed in, the belief that slavery was a benevolent institution, and maybe most importantly, that slavery was not the root cause of the war. The Lost Cause is one of the most notoriously effective efforts to rewrite history, and it was done by the losing side. So how did it become so deeply rooted in Southern memory? Blame the United Daughters of the Confederacy. The UDC was founded in Nashville in 1894 to preserve Confederate culture for generations to come. The women who made up the group descended from elite antebellum families, and they used their social and political clout to spread the pro-Southern version of the war as real history. You've probably seen their efforts to honor the Confederacy, but maybe you didn't know it was the UDC. They're the ones who covered the Southern landscape with memorials for Confederate leaders and soldiers. They used their fundraising and lobbying skills to pressure local governments into erecting monuments in prominent public spaces like courthouses and state capitals. Installed here next to the state capitol by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. The United Daughters of the Confederacy donated this memorial to the city back in the 30s. They put them along roadsides and in parks. Any place that was remotely relevant to the Confederacy was memorialized. By the early 20th century, the UDC had 100,000 members and chapters spread all over the country, but mostly in former Confederate states. And there's a reason they grew so quickly during that time. So we're talking about roughly three decades after the end of the war, and the Confederate veterans themselves are beginning to die off. So there is this push to find ways to commemorate, because the big challenge by 1900 was there's a new generation of white Southerners being born, and they never experienced the, the war years. That push is visible. Most of the Confederate monuments were erected during the UDC's height of influence. There's a rhetoric around monuments that we want to get the, this thing built before all of that generation has died off. And the reason we want it is to teach future generations about those men. Dr. Karen Cox wrote the book on the UDC, and I asked her if it was fair to say the group established the lost cause as historical fact in the South. Oh my God, yeah, they were the leaders of the lost cause into the 20th century, and they made it a movement about vindication. Just to give you an idea of how effective they were, they successfully lobbied for a Confederate memorial in Arlington National Cemetery, which U.S. President Woodrow Wilson proudly unveiled to a cheering crowd. 
And that's influence, right? Monuments are the least of what they did. Uh, what? I mean, they, they are the most visible and tangible, but the work with children was far more influential. It turns out a central UDC objective is shaping how children think about the war and their Southern heritage. One of their most powerful tools, textbooks. Take a look at this pamphlet called A Measuring Rod for Textbooks. It was written by the illustrious Southern historian, Miss Mildred Rutherford, an educator, orator, and author of Southern history textbooks. She's also very pro-slavery. The pamphlet announced the formation of a textbook review committee featuring prominent Southerners like five former Confederate generals. This group was committed to spreading the truths of Confederate history, so they instructed school boards to reject any textbooks that did not accord full justice to the South. And they urged libraries to deface every book in their collection that didn't measure up by writing the words unjust to the South clearly on its cover. This pamphlet was shared widely with school boards throughout the South, and UDC-backed committees closely monitored history books to make sure Northern influence never reached classrooms. So the core language of an approved textbook aligned precisely with that of the lost cause. You know, stuff like, the Confederacy lost in the war between the states, but Georgia never forgot to honor her Confederate soldiers. History of Georgia was on the UDC's approved list. It was also written by E. Merton Coulter, a self-described Southern historian and historian-described white supremacist. They understand that how you educate, who wins the writing game, who wins the, the battle over history, ultimately wins the war. That's the big fight for the UDC. But their work with children went further than the classrooms. The UDC formed an auxiliary group called the Children of the Confederacy, which was designed to get kids born in former Confederate states to actively participate in their version of history. Group leaders had kids recite call and response truths from something called the Confederate Catechism. Children up to the age of 18 would compete and be rewarded for memorizing long passages of lost cause rhetoric. So it would be like an after school thing, you know, like that was your club. You would go after school to the meeting of the children of the Confederacy and your leader might teach you songs of the South like Dixie or other songs that were considered Southern patriotic songs. They would have them write essays, go hey, visit the veterans, pa pause it right and there, JT. learn catechism. Children were also the centerpiece of their community's monument unveilings, like this living flag JT, pause the dedication there, I know we're out of the Stonewall Jackson Monument in Richmond. Yes, those are school children. The UDC's efforts shaped the identities of children who grew up with the lost cause. They made history personal, and that made their story last longer. Generations of generations of children learning that narrative in a variety of ways grow up to be, you know, segregationists in the 50s and 60s, because that's been drilled into them since they were children. After World War I, the UDC started losing steam, but the damage was done. The monuments were in place, and the textbooks they wrote remained in Southern classrooms until the late 70s. And the women's group did it all without the right to vote or participate in politics. You can still get glimmers of this lost cause memory of the war from people who will always choose to see it through the personal. And I think the UDC, to a great extent, was that was their goal. So the next time someone says the Confederate monuments are about remembering our history, just know that that's exactly what the United Daughters of the Confederacy wants you to think. All right. Okay, guys. Okay. Right. Hey, stop. Stop it right there, JT. Okay, we're out of time. That's at Vox. Uh, that's from Vox.com. It's on YouTube. How Southern Socialites rewrote Civil War history. Check that out. Also, download the document "Teaching Hard History: American Slavery." Teaching Hard History: American Slavery from the Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLCenter.org. You've heard me talk about this before. This helps to correct a lot of this misinformation. This is what we're dealing with. OK, the misinformation about the con the Confederacy, which ties into misinformation about the history of slavery. All right. Uh, we're going to continue on my social media platforms of uh, the African History Network and Michael M. Hotep on YouTube. We're out of time here. Remember, uh, you can donate dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Remember, right now is correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you next week. Stay tuned for Pastor Mo. Peace. OK, so. That was from. Um, that was a good piece from box.com dealing with the history of uh, the Confederacy. All right. How's everybody doing? This is a uh, Michael M. Hotel. This is the African history network show. Uh, we're on Sundays, 9 PM to 11 PM Eastern standard time. We broadcast on 9, 10 a.m. The superstation WFDF uh, here in Detroit and on my social media platforms, the African history network and on YouTube as well. In the first hour, we were joined by economist, Dr. Julian Malvo. Uh, talking about the upcoming documentary, uh, Hapi, dealing with the role of um, 
economics, um, how P the role of economics on the development of civilization. All right. So uh, let me get into the, uh, well, let's talk a little bit about uh, coronavirus, do a quick update on coronavirus. Uh, coronavirus update, Florida shatters single day infection record with 15,300 new cases. That was reported on uh, uh, 15,300. That was actually reported uh, Sunday, actually, I think it was. Florida is set to hold the Republican National Convention in Jacksonville next month and has ordered schools to reopen five days a week. Um, Donald Trump on Saturday wore a mask in public for the first time while visiting wounded service members and health care workers at Walter Reed uh, National Military Medical Center. Trump has previously shown disdain toward face coverings amid the coronavirus pandemic and refused to wear them. Uh, Louisiana's Democratic uh, governor announced a new requirement that most people wear a mask in public. The state's uh, Republican lawmakers have opposed coronavirus restrictions. Now, we saw that Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida, reopened after having been shuttered for nearly four months, even as Florida continued to report uh, record infections. Uh, testing supplies in the state are running low in the state of Florida, and some big labs are taking several days to return results, Governor Ron DeSantis said at a news conference. He partly attributed the backlog to testing many asymptomatic people. Um, things are going to get worse in Florida. You, you're having people come to an amusement park and you have a shortage, a shortage of tests in Florida and you have in Florida consistently um, having a record number of cases each day. Now, shortly before Florida announced the new cases, uh, the Education Secretary Betsy Clueless, Betsy DeVos, made the rounds on Sunday uh, news talk shows where she continued to press schools to reopen even as fresh evidence emerged that the United States uh, was failing to control new ways of infection and death. Uh, in an interview, so, so the numbers uh, from Florida, that is, that, 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 th those were the numbers for Saturday, 15,300 new cases. That was announced on Sunday, but it was the numbers for Saturday, 15,300 new cases in one day. Now, in an interview with CNN State of the Union, Betsy DeVos said she would like to see closed, closed schools be the exception rather than the norm. The goal needs to be that kids are learning full time this fall, she said. Kids need to get back in the classroom. Okay, so they don't have a coherent plan to deal with this. The Trump administration does not have a coherent national plan to deal with this, to deal with coronavirus. Donald Trump for a long time just hoped it would go away. Okay. And he even said one day, this is all just going to go away. All right. Back in February, he said, we have 15 cases pretty soon is going to be down to zero. I told you, there may be a zero on the number, but it's not going to be anywhere near zero. Okay. And this is, this is what we're, this is what we're dealing with. Um, and let's see, let's look at the, let's see if we can pull up the, uh, national num the, uh, national numbers from, uh, John Hopkins university. All right, now, Betsy DeVos added on Fox News Sunday that the Trump administration was looking at all the options for pulling uh, federal funding from schools that don't open in the fall. She said, quote, American investment in education is a promise to students and their families. She said, if schools are going to reopen, they should, they should not get the funds. Her remarks drew swift criticism from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, while the government health, uh, while the government health official in charge of testing signaled that the virus was still spreading too quickly to allow children to return to classrooms. Now, at the, at the very same time all this is taking place, the White House led by Donald John Trump, okay, uh, what they're doing is they are undermining the credibility of Dr. Anthony Fauci. Because Dr. Anthony Fauci is, is, is doing interviews, not, in, not on MSNBC in general, but he's doing interviews, really talking about telling the truth and talking about how, how this is not over, this is not under control, this is not going well. And 
Trump is trying to undermine Anthony Fauci because Trump knows this is not going well as well. So the reopening of schools has emerged as the latest fault line in the country's faltering pandemic response with Donald Trump and Betsy DeVos pressing the case that a return to normal academic life is in the student's best interest. Donald Trump last week attacked school reopening guidelines from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, as expensive and, and impractical. And Betsy DeVos said it was imperative that schools resume five days a week, a five day a week classroom instruction. But to, be, to, to open up in late August or early September, there's a clampdown that has to take place now. And they're not advocating for that. So if you're, if you're trying to force schools to open, and it's up to governors to open up. It's up to governors to open up the schools because the governors were the ones that shut down schools like Governor Gretchen Whitmer here in the state of Michigan through executive orders. If you're trying to force governors to do this, then you're literally, see what this is all about is, Trump wants to get the economy started back up so he can win re-election. And by winning re-election also, he avoids prosecution in places like the state of New York. Because by the time he gets out of office in 2024, 20, January 2025, the statute of limitation will run out on a lot of those um, charges. But to be able to get the economy back open, parents have to have somewhere to send their children when they go back to work. So you have to open up schools. But if you want to open up the schools, you have to slow the spread of coronavirus and get this under control. You can't slow the spread of coronavirus and get it under control when you're dealing with the U.S. setting records day after day after day. So Reuters.com reported on Friday, July 10th, 2020, U.S. sets record for new COVID cases third day in a row at over 69,000. New cases of COVID-19 rose by over 69,000 across the United States on Friday, July 10th, 2020, and according to a Reuters.com uh, tally, setting a record for the third consecutive day as Walt Disney Company stuck to its plan to open its flagship theme park in hard-hit Florida. A total of nine U.S. states, Alaska, Georgia, Idaho, Iowa, Louisiana, Montana, Ohio, Utah, and Wisconsin also reached records for single day infections. Nine states reached a record for single day infections on Friday, July 10th. Alaska, Georgia, Idaho, Iowa, Louisiana, Montana, Ohio, Utah, and Wisconsin. In the state of Texas, which is another hot zone, Governor Greg Abbott warned on Friday, July 10th, he may have to impose new clampdowns if the state cannot stem its record-setting caseloads and hospitalizations through masks and social distancing. He said, quote, if we don't adopt this best practice, it could lead to a shutdown of business. If we don't adopt this best practice, it could lead to a shutdown of business. The Republican governor told local KLB BKTV in Lubbock, Texas, adding it was the last thing he wanted. So what a lot of people are saying, and, and economist Dr. Julian Malvo will attest to this as well, you can't keep shutting down businesses and opening back up and then shutting them down. A lot of these businesses, it's estimated now that about 50% of these businesses, not African-American-owned businesses, 50% of these businesses in general, well, let me put it like this, it's estimated that 50% of the jobs that have been, have been lost due to coronavirus is estimated that 50% of these jobs won't come back. And it's estimated that a good percentage of these businesses will not survive. Now, blackenterprise.com had an article about a week ago, and we talked about it here on this show, where 40, it's estimated 45% of African-American owned businesses won't last the next six weeks, okay? So this is serious, once again, is an example of how elections have consequences and how politics impacts every aspect of your life and how 
and so all the people that said we don't need to vote, we just need to invest in the stock market and 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 do economic empowerment and build businesses and all this stuff. Well, a lot of those businesses that were built are gonna go out of business and not come back. This is this is what happens when you don't see threats coming, perceived threats coming, and take action to stop them. And politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Politics creates the economic environment that your business operates within. And most likely your business operates on the premise of people having money to come and spend with your business. So you can stay in business. Because otherwise, you're going to have to get a job in a cubicle next to them if your ass goes out of business. So if you're focusing on owning a business, especially African-American-owned business, wouldn't you want somebody in office who's the most responsible with the economy as opposed to someone who don't even understand how the economy works? I mean, that's just logical if you understand how all this connects together. I mean, if you actually understand that. Now, if you don't understand that and you listen to simple, silent ass people on social media don't know what the hell they're talking about, well, you know, you see what you get. Now, California announced on Friday the state will release up to 8,000 inmates early from prisons to slow the spread of COVID-19 inside the facilities. California announced this on Friday, July 10th. As, at San Quentin State Prison outside San Francisco, half of the facilities, roughly 3,300 prisoners, have tested positive for the virus. The Walt Disney Company said the theme parks in Orlando would open on Saturday to a limited number of guests who, along with employees, would be required to wear masks and undergo temperature checks. The park also canceled parades, fireworks displays, and events that typically draw crowds. Disney's chief medical officer said earlier this week she believed the rules would allow guests to visit the park safely. Roughly 19,000 people, including some theme park workers, have signed a petition asking Disney to delay the reopening. To delay the reopening. The union representing 750 uh, Walt Disney World performers has filed a grievance against the company claiming retaliation against members over a union demand that they be tested for COVID-19. Now, other theme parks opened in Orlando, Florida in June, including Comcast Corporation's uh, Universal Studios, Orlando, and SeaWorld Entertainment's uh, uh, SeaWorld. Okay, so check out the rest of the article from Reuters.com. We posted it on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, when it came out. U.S. sets record for new COVID cases, third day in a row at over 69,000. Let's go back to the updates from the Washington Post. Washington Post has really, really good updates throughout the day dealing with coronavirus. Um, that's at WashingtonPost.com. Uh, Let's go back to these updates. Coronavirus update. Florida shatters single day infection record with 15,300 new cases. Florida uh, shatters single day infection record with 15,300 new cases. Also, we see that the U.S. Uh, has three point, a little over 3.3 million reported cases. And um, worldwide is 12.8 million cases. And it is um, 568,000 uh, deaths worldwide, 12.8 million cases worldwide, 568,000 deaths worldwide. And what's the recovery rate? That's recovered. Um, I'll get the recovery rate here in just a sec. I'll get the number of recoveries also. We know in the U.S. you've had um, 135,000 deaths and you've had, um, let's see, we'll look at the recovery. In the U.S. you've had, I 
trying to pull up the number of uh, recoveries here in the U.S. Recovered. Um, so you've had about a million people who've recovered in the U.S., about a million people. So 3.3, a little over 3.3 million cases in the U.S., and uh, about a million people have recovered in the U.S., okay? And we're dealing with about 135,000 deaths in the U.S. Now, recovery doesn't mean you got it and it was no problem for you. It could have been horrific. You could have been hospitalized. could have been on a ventilator. Okay? And you survived and you recovered. So a lot of times people look at recovery as, oh, it was no problem. It was just like sniffles. No, not necessarily. For some people, it may not have been a problem. For other people, it may have been traumatic. And when you're in the hospital, your family members in general can't come see you because there's a, there's a lack of personal protective equipment. So when you're in the hospital, you're in the hospital, you know, your family members can't come see you in general. All right, let's continue here. Uh, let's look at these, look at some more of these updates and we're going to get to uh, some of this information dealing with Jack Johnson. Just a minute here. All right. So many school districts have been quick to push back on this push to try to get them to open back up and there's no clear plan, no strategy in place to get coronavirus under control. Many school districts have been quick to push back with some saying they were concerned about health risks to students and staff and proposed instead hybrid models using at home and in school teaching. Major questions remain about the role children and teenagers play in spreading coronavirus with health experts, uh, while which health experts say travels quickly in crowded indoor spaces. Now, Nancy Pelosi called Betsy DeVos's message, quote, malfeasance and dereliction of duty, end quote, and accused the Trump administration of messing with the, with the health of children messing with the health of our children in an interview with CNN on Sunday, Sunday, July 12th. Nancy Pelosi called on Trump to invoke the Defense Production Act to make sure schools and others have more access to, pers uh, to personal protective equipment as the school year approaches. She also said the Center for Disease Control should take the lead in mandating health guidelines rather than just offering guidance. Quote, they should be mandates, not requirements, Nancy Pelosi said of uh, the CDC's rules for schools. Now, state officials in Florida have already acted on the Trump administration's demands ordering last week that public schools fully reopen in August. This is... Now, I guarantee you, if Governor, if, if, Ron, if, if Andrew Gillum the African-American that ran for gover governor in Florida, I guarantee you if Andrew Gillum had become governor, coronavirus would not be this serious in Florida. He would have taken steps. You've been more responsible, would have shut beaches down sooner, shut down businesses sooner, wouldn't be so quick to open them up. But this is an example of how elections have consequences. This is about judgment. This is about judgment and preserving people's lives as opposed to focusing on the economy. Because literally, Trump is willing to sacrifice our children's lives to jumpstart his economy so he can win a second, so he can win re-election. That's what this is about. He don't get, he's willing to sacrifice children's lives, but not just children, the lives of teachers, because the children aren't in school by themselves. They're in school with teachers, administrators, counselors, school nurses, janitors, people that work in the lunchroom, the lunch ladies, different things like this. 
State officials in the state of Florida have already acted on the Trump administration's demands ordering last week that public schools fully reopen in August 2020. At the very same time, Florida is, Florida is setting records for new coronavirus cases, 15,300 new cases on Saturday, July 12th. In Miami-Dade County, Florida, school superintendents Alberto uh, Carvalho said students could return to classrooms six weeks from now if people adhere to restrictions such as wearing masks and practicing social distancing. But the decision will require buy-in from the community and might be dictated by science, he said. How many of you all feel comfortable sending your children back to school in August next month? I mean, I'm, what's September? How many of you all feel comfortable sending your children back to school? Quote, we need the science to drive the practice rather than politics influencing what is legitimately a community concern. Um, Alberto Cavallo told NBC News Meet the Press, NBC News' Meet the Press, adding that the positivity rate in the county had gone from 6% to 29.1% in recent months. In Miami-Dade County, the positivity rate had gone from 6% to 29.1%. That means the percentage of the coronavirus tests that come back positive. It had gone from 6% to 29.1% in recent months. Houston Mayor Sylvester Turner, who's a Democrat and African-American, said it was too early to debate school reopenings with infections soaring in the city of Houston, Texas. It's gonna be a whole lot of African-Americans who just a few months ago was saying black people can't get coronavirus or why aren't any black celebrities getting coronavirus or this is a hoax and all this stuff. It's going to a lot of them there is going to get coronavirus. Unfortunately, some of them are going to die. It's too much misinformation floating around on social media. Too many people trying to elevate their social media platform, putting bullshit out. Quote, it makes no sense to be having this conversation while this virus is out of control, Mayor Sylvester Turner told KHOU. Quote, you don't send kids back to school when there's a raging fire and the fire's still burning in August, end quote. Even in places that have not registered a sharp rise in cases, officials are resisting instructions to bring schools back. Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, who is a Republican, said Sunday, he was on Meet the Press. He was on Meet, uh, I think he was on Meet the Press today on one of the Sunday shows. He said that his state would not be, quote, rushed into, quote, fully reopening schools, saying it would take a hybrid approach to learning during the pandemic. So, you know, you, you have to sit back and ask the question, why are you trying to, first of all, Trump says the reason why you have more cases is because there are more tests. He doesn't want to talk about the, the, the drastic increase in the infection rate. He doesn't want to talk about that at all. Two, you want to withdraw federal funding for testing sites in, in, in key states okay, that have, have had a big increase in coronavirus cases. You want to withdraw federal funding for testing sites there. But then you want to force governors to open schools back up. And you don't have a plan in place to deal with all this. Quote, everybody would like to get our kids back to school as quickly as we can, but we also want to do it and make sure our kids are going to be as safe as possible, Governor Larry Hogan said during an appearance on Meet the Press. Now, according to a proposal from Montgomery County, the state's largest school district, schools would open on August 31st with, re with remote learning. Students would gradually return to school building, a, return, to a school, to return to school buildings for up to two days a week in the fall. Now, nationwide, new cases reached record highs in states across the country on Saturday, July 11th, even as weekly testing plateaued. Nine states in nearly every major region of the country reported record new single-day caseloads on Saturday, 
July 11th, South Carolina, Texas, Alaska, Arkansas, North Carolina, Idaho, Wisconsin, Oregon, and Hawaii. Six of those states, along with 10 others, registered new seven-day average case highs, according to the tracking by the Washington Post. Saturday, July 11th, also marked the first time since the beginning of the pandemic that multiple states reported more than 10,000 cases in a day, and you trying to send children back to school? This is how wicked and deceitful Donald Trump is. He's willing to sacrifice our children, not his. He's willing to sacrifice our children to win re-election. Texas tallied a record of 10,351 new cases in a single day. And Florida reported 10,360. Okay, that was on, um, they reported that on Saturday. On Sunday, July 12th, Florida reported 15,300 new cases. That is that was new cases from Saturday, the day before. 15,300 new cases. Now, Tom Inglesby, I-N-G-L-E-S-B-Y, who directs the Center for Health Security at John Hopkins University, told Fox News's, Fox News Sunday that, quote, we should not accept as normal the 800 or 900 deaths that we have in this country, end quote, end quote, pointing to much lower fatality numbers in other countries. Now, new testing, meanwhile, is slowing nationwide after increasing throughout the spring. About 4.6 million diagnostic tests were administered in the United States last week, compared with 4.5 million the previous week, according to the COVID tracking project. Okay, check out the uh, updates from the Washington Post. They have uh, some really good uh, updates and um, they make their updates free so you don't have to, uh, you don't have to have a su subscription to read them. I have a um, digital subscription to the Washington Post so I read the Post in New York Times every day. But they're a lot of that information is restricted to those who have uh, subscriptions. Long delays in getting test results hobble U.S. response. See, this is, now, this is the other thing. So Donald Trump said everybody wants a test and get a test. He didn't tell you how long you're going to have to wait in line to get a test. Then he didn't tell you how long you're going to have to wait for the results. Some people are having to wait five, six, seven, eight days for results. Washington Post reported on July 12, 2020, Long delays in getting test results hobble coronavirus response. You can't do contact tracing and it takes five, six, seven days for people to get results. They've infected a whole lot of people since then. Test results for the novel coronavirus are taking so long to come back that experts say the results across the United States are often proving useless in the campaign to control the deadly disease. Some testing sites are struggling to provide results in five to seven days. Others are taking even longer. Outbreaks across the Sun Belt have strained labs beyond capacity. That rising demand in turn has caused shortages of swabs, chemical reagents, and equipment as far away as New York. The long testing turnaround, the long testing turnaround times are making it impossible for the United States to replicate the central strategy used by other countries to effectively con contain the virus. Test, trace, and isolate. Test, trace, and isolate. Like catching any killer, speed is of the essence when it comes to the coronavirus. Now, Crystal R. Watson, a public health expert at John Hopkins, Hopkins University, said, instead of going from one step to the next, it's like you're already stumbling right out the gate. It makes contact tracing almost useless. By the time a person is getting results, they already have symptoms. Their contacts may already have symptoms and have gone on to infect others. This is what happens when you have incompetent leadership. Quote, after attending a funeral, Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms and her family got tested June 29th as a precaution. 
No one in her family had developed symptoms. No one in her family had developed symptoms. A week later, her test results still had not come back, but her husband started feeling ill. So they got a different rapid test through Emory University. Within hours, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, mayor of Atlanta, learned that she, her husband, and one of the couple's four children had all been infected. She was still waiting on test results from the previous test that she took June 29th but started developing symptoms while she's waiting on the test results to come back. It wasn't until the next day that their initial test results finally arrived. They showed that when the family first got tested, only one of them, the child, had the virus. While they waited for their test results, the boy possibly passed it to his parents. And you want to send children back to school and you don't have this under control? Quote, it really speaks to the failure of testing in this country right now, end quote, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottom said in an interview Friday. Quote, had we known we had an asymptomatic child in the house, we would have immediately quarantined and taken all the precautions, end quote. Instead, the mayor's husband, Derek Bottoms, 56 years old, turned feverish and fatigued, experiencing night sweats. He lost 20 pounds in a week, uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms said. Now, more efficient testing, such as in South Korea, where results are often given the next day, might have prevented uh, what Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms' family experienced and prevented them from getting the virus. But such turnarounds seem out of reach in the United States because of lack of, a, uh, because of lack of federal coordination. Now there was coordination between the Trump campaign and Russia, but you can't have federal coordination between 50 states to save lives. You can have coordination with a foreign adversary to still an election, but you can't have coordination. Remember Fred Sanford said, you got to coordinate Okay, he said, well, Pops, Pops said you got to coordinate, but Fred Sanford always talks about coordinating. Okay, there's lack of coordination, there's lack of a national plan. But when you lack leadership skills, you fail to lead. But such turnarounds seem out of reach in the United States because of lack of because of a lack of federal coordination. Supply shortages and surging demand as outbreaks in some states spiral out of control. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the United States has been plagued by testing problems. In the past four months, testing capacity expanded dramatically. Roughly 40 million tests have now been conducted. There are 330 million people in the country. 40 million, roughly 40 million have been tested. But the federal government never fixed fundamental infrastructure problems, experts say. Read the rest of this article here. This is from July 12, 2020, Washington Post. Long delays in getting test results hobble coronavirus response. As I explained numerous times to people in 2016, the presidential election is not about one person versus another person. Not at all. This 4,000 positions Trump had to fill in his administration. This is about ideology. This is about the trajectory of the country for decades. Okay, read that article. How's everybody doing? Okay, let's get into uh, this information dealing with uh, Jack Johnson. I saw an article from um, Equal Justice Initiative, EJI.org of July 4th, 1910. And I wanted to uh, pull something up also from um, history.com as well. But uh, on July 4th, 1910, African-American boxer Jack Johnson bested Jim Jeffries, nicknamed the Great White Hope. Jim Jeffries was called the Great White Hope in a highly publicized interracial heavyweight title match fought in Reno, Nevada before 20,000 spectators. 
Now, uh, Jack Johnson was born in Galveston, Texas in 1878. And we know Galveston, Texas, that's where General uh, Gordon Granger in um, 1865, uh, June 19th, 1865, that's where he delivered General Order Number 3 to the enslaved Africans there in uh, Galveston, Texas. So Jack Johnson was born in Galveston, Texas in 1878 and began his professional boxing career in 1897. At the turn of the 19th century, boxing was now on the commercialized, uh, was now um, on the commercialized sports scene and racial discrimination permeated the sport in both spectatorship and competition. Black boxers were often barred from competition in championship title matches. That's um, discrimination. That's you dealing with racism. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. Okay. So after much success, Jack Johnson challenged Jim Jeffries, a white boxer and then reigning uh, champion. Uh, Jim Jeffries, however, refused to fight black boxers. He turned down uh, Jack Johnson's challenge and retired undefeated in 1905. So that's white privilege, where you could be heavyweight champion of the world and you refuse to fight African-American boxers, okay? Because you weren't the heavyweight champion of America. They say you were the heavyweight champion of the world, but you refused to fight African-American boxers, denying African-Americans of opportunity, and you really ain't the champion when you refuse to fight an entire race of people. So Canadian boxer Tommy Burns replaced uh, Jim Jeffries as the heavyweight champion and after repeated challenges agreed to face Jack Johnson in an interracial match in December 1908. Jack Johnson uh, dominated uh, Tommy Burns in a 14-round contest that had to be stopped by police and officials deemed him the winner by technical knockout, okay? Um, yeah, he, so, uh, correction, I think he said he won the championship July 4th, 1910. No, he beat, he won the champion, um, Jack Johnson won the championship in 1908. He beat Jim Jeffries, the former champion, um, July 4th, 1910, okay? All right, so, so Canadian boxer, uh, Tommy Burns replaced Jim Jeffries as the heavyweight champion and after repeated challenges agreed to face Jack Johnson in an interracial match in December 1908. Um, Jack Johnson dominated Burns in a 14-round contest that had to be stopped by police and officials deemed him the winner by technical knockout. This win made Jack Johnson the first African-American heavyweight champion in boxing history. Now, many white boxing fans were outraged by a black world champion and urged Jim Jeffries to come out of retirement to fight Jack Johnson and return the heavyweight title into white hands. Okay. Jim Jeffries agreed and was soon the great white hope, the great white hope. Racial tension was high leading up to the fight. But Jack Johnson easily retained his heavyweight title and shocked the nation when Jim Jeffries threw in the towel in the 15th round. Jim Jeffries readily admit, admitted Jack Johnson's skill, quote, I couldn't have beat Johnson at my best, end quote, he told reporters. But white outrage over the match, res uh, white outrage over the match results sparked riots in cities throughout the country and left many African-Americans injured or dead. Now, there's a scene in the, um, there's a scene in the series Self-Made about Madam C.J. Walker, which is on Netflix. There's a scene when they talk about what happened uh, in 1910. So I think they are referring to, I, I think the scene took place in 1910 and because they're referring to jack a jack johnson fight okay if it took place in 1910 this is the fight they're talking about i think it was 1910 as opposed to 1908 and i'm trying to see 
if I have my notes here on self-made because I watched it and took notes on it. But uh, there's a scene where they talk about the uh, lynchings of African-Americans that took place after the Jack Johnson uh, fight and how Jack Johnson um, won. Let me see here. Here are my notes. So I did a, I did a video dealing with self-made. Go check that out. That's on our YouTube channel and Facebook fan page. Okay, so that scene took place in 1908. So that, uh, that that's, I'm looking at my notes here. It looks like that scene took place in 1908. So that was when Jack Johnson won the championship, okay, in 1908. And uh, in the movie, they said 26 Negroes killed because of Jack Johnson winning the fight. Uh, it was a scene where they were going to church and they said there were riots in seven, uh, one person said riots in seven cities. The other person said, I heard 10 cities. Okay, so they just talked about it briefly there for 30 seconds to a minute. But this is, this, this is real history here, okay? Meanwhile, Jack Johnson's impressive success and bold personality infuriated white supremacists who saw his dominance of boxing as an affront to the, to the fact, quote unquote, fact of white supremacy, fact in their mind of white supremacy and his romantic relations with white women as an added insult. Though he remained undefeated as a boxer, bitter, bitter officials weaponized federal laws against sex trafficking to prosecute Jack Johnson for his consensual relationships resulting in in a brief imprisonment. Jack Johnson lost his heavyweight title in a 1915 fight in Havana, Cuba, and some rumors insisted he did so on purpose in hopes of easing the legal persecution against him. Jack, Jack Johnson died in a car crash in 1946, okay? So uh, read this uh, article here from EJI.org, Equal Justice Initiative. Uh, July 4th, 1910, Jack Johnson defeats great white hope, Jim Jeffries, sparking white outrage. All right, look, hey, uh, we have to get out of here. Remember at the African History Network, um, you can donate to the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App that helps us uh, finance our Sunday night show, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Uh, or through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show through PayPal. Uh, all of my lectures are available at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. This is one of my latest ones here dealing with the real history of Juneteenth. There's a three hour presentation, Juneteenth history, Emancipation Day, but not Independence Day. We never got our 40 acres and the mule. Also deal with Dr. King's Poor People's Campaign. We're coming to get our check. And then uh, also I have a extensive lecture I've done dealing with the history of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma also. And uh, that's around here somewhere. Okay, that's all at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right, remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next week. Peace.